Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on load zone buildings. We're in chapter two, section two, uh, subsection three, and this is our fourth video uh, covering the loads material up to this point. So it's video D. We're dealing with the equation P equals lowercase p times A. In other words, total cumulative force is pressure times whatever area that pressure is exerted over, or P being an area distributed force, such as a lab load or dead load for a floor. We're interested in applying this formula specifically to find the axial force P on any column that's supporting some portion of our deck or our floor. And again, we're doing example calculations this follows by definition, by the way, pressure is equal to a force times an area. So we could divide both sides of this equation by area, and we'd have lowercase p is equal to uppercase p divided by area, um, which is the definition of an area distributed load. <coughs> We're still talking about the two-story building, which has a bottom floor as a slab on grade and the elevated floor as a composite uh, decking of corrugated steel and concrete. The framing plans for this elevated floor and the roof are both as depicted in the following diagram. We've got columns every 30 feet. Here we have perimeter girders, interior girders, and a series of joists or secondary beams. So we might call this and this primary beams and these secondary beams or we can call these girders and these joists. Um, previously we had a video where we uh, described the portions of the floor that were associated with each beam. So for example we had a beam here which is a joist and has a 5 foot wide swash of floor. This perimeter girder has a 15 foot wide swash of floor and the interior girder has a 30 foot wide swash of floor. And we applied the formula W is equal to PS. We're now going to ask ourselves what portion of the floor is associated with columns and instead of the formula W is equal to PS we're going to look at the formula uppercase P which is cumulative or total force is equal to the area distributed force times whatever area of floor is associated with that column. So this column supports halfway to the next column in this direction and halfway to the next column in this direction. So we chalk off a little square here that's 15 feet by 15 feet and we say that amount of floor is the responsibility of this corner column. Likewise we come over here and we say this column is responsible for the floor halfway to that column and it's responsible for the floor halfway to this column which gives us a 30 foot width of floor in that direction and then it has to support halfway over to this column which goes 15 feet out. So in other words the total floor area that's the responsibility of this column is 15 feet times 30 feet. And finally, the column at the center, which we'll sometimes call the center column or interior column, has to support halfway over to this column, halfway over to that column, halfway over to this column, and halfway to that one. So in other words, it supports a f an area of floor that's 30 feet by 30 feet. <clears throat> so one of the things you'll notice is um, this area for the interior column is twice this area for a column in the exterior wall which is twice the area of floor associated with this corner column. So this area is 15 by 15 which is 225 so if we want to figure out the total force on that column we're going to use an area that's 225. Um, this one is 30 by 15, which is 450 square feet that's associated with this column. So if we want to know the force in this column, 
the axial force P will put 450 square feet here. And finally, this column supports an area that's 30 by 30, which is 900 square feet, and that would be the area that we would insert into this formula to figure out the axial force in that column right there. So, as before, we got to have loads, and we're keeping the same load case that we've been dealing with all along, which is the roof area distributed dead load is 20 pounds a square foot, the roof area distributed, distributed live load is 20 pounds a square foot. The dead load on the floor is 53 pounds a square foot. And the live load on the floor is 100 pounds a square foot. <coughs> so, if we want to know what's happening on an interior column, so we're talking about the interior column, which happens to be the center column for the particular uh, grid that we're looking at, but if we had a much larger grid, we'd have a bunch of interior columns, some of which might not be the center column, but the formula would be the same. So we're going to use the terminology interior column in this case. So here we're looking at the, we're trying to find the force that we have to design for in that interior column. And keep in mind that the roof delivers a load to the segment of column between the elevated floor and the roof, and that's the only load in that segment of the column. When we go to the portion of the column that's between the slab on grade and the, the elevated floor, it has to carry both the load of the roof and the load of the floor. Typically in steel construction, we're not going to start a, a new column segment at every floor. We will go several floors or at least two floors. Um, and in a two-story building, we never even dream of doing two columns, one for each story. What we're going to do is we're going to have a continuous column that's the full height of the building. So to size that column, we need to go look at the portion of the column that's under the greatest burden, which means we want to look at the portion of the column between the ground and the elevated floor, because that's the portion that's carrying both roof load and floor load. So we have four things that we have to account for. One is the dead load from the roof, the live load from the roof, the dead load from the floor, and the live load from the floor. So we'll start with the roof. We'll talk about dead load. P dead on the roof is 20 pounds a square foot. The area associated with an interior column is 900 square feet. So when we multiply those together, the feet squared cancel out the feet squared and we're left with pounds. And 20 times 900 is 18,000. So we have 18,000 pounds or 18 kips. Then we can shift to the live load associated with the roof. It's P live on the roof, which is 20 pounds a square foot, times the uh, area that the column's responsible for, which we've deduced to be 900 square feet. So again, the feet squared cancel out. We're left with pounds. 20 times 900 is 18,000, or in other words, 18 kips. Now to account for the floor the load in the column from the dead load associated with the floor, we pay, we take the area distributed dead load of the floor times the area for which the column is responsible. The area distributed dead load of the floor is 53 pounds a square foot times the area that's associated with the column, which again, because it's an interior column, it's 900 square feet of area. Again, the feet squared cancel out numerator and denominator. We're left with pounds. 53 times 900 is 47,700 pounds, or 47.7 kips. Finally, we have the axial force from the live load from the floor on the interior column. It's P live on the floor times the area of the floor, which is 100 pounds per square foot of area distributed load times an area of 900 square feet. The feet squared cancel out. We're left with pounds and it's 90,000 pounds, which is 90 kips. 
Now if we want to know the total factored load from both floor and roof on the interior column, it's factored, so we have to put in the dead load factor of 1.2 times the dead load from the roof plus the live load factor of 1.6 times the live load from the roof. So here we put 18K right there and 18K right there plus the dead load factor of 1.2 times the dead load from the floor which is 47.7 kips plus the live load factor times the live load from the floor which is 90 kips. We do all that and we get 252 kips which is the axial force that that column has to safely hold. And the, the margins of safety of course are here but in other words that column has to have at least this much strength which gives us margins of safety relative to both live load and dead load. Now, just to make sure that these numbers aren't perceived as some isolated or meaningless numerical processing of numbers, uh, I'm introducing you to a kind of table which you can find in the American Institute of Steel Construction um, manual. This is for wide flange shapes used as columns and the table is the design strength and axial compression so these columns are going to have an axial force in them and um, this is what we can take as the capacity of these beams. You'll notice by the way there's a fee factor here. This is a so-called resistance factor from this particular steel manual which is a couple of editions back this factor is 0.85. What we're saying is we're going to lower the numbers for this column as some sort of indicator that we don't have absolute confidence in the column. In other words, this is another margin of safety where they're saying whatever the failure stress is times the gross area of this column that would be the expected capacity of the column. We're going to reduce that by 0.85 before we put the numbers in this table. So let's look across here. It says shape W10 by. So in wide flange sections, and we'll get to all this more in the materials, so I'm just kind of giving you this table right now to give you a, a sense or the flavor of how we use information in this field. We've got a W10, which means the nominal depth of this section is 10 feet in this direction. Uh, W10 by 49, the 49 would mean that it's 49 pounds per linear foot. It turns out a W10 by 49 is about square in that the width of the flange is almost exactly equal to the depth, so it's a really well-balanced column. Um, but a W10 by 49 means its effective depth or nominal depth is 10 inches and it weighs 49 pounds per foot. Uh, here we have the effective length right here in feet. So for example, if we had a column that was 16 feet tall and it was more or less pin jointed top and bottom, then this, these numbers here tell us the safe factored load, the acceptable factored load that this column can resist. So if we go back a second, we're saying the factored load on this column is 252 kips. So now we can scan through this table for an effective length of 60, 16 feet and we're looking for 252 and we come along here and we have 290 and 246. The column that can only handle 246 kips of axial force is not good enough. This one is a bit over designed, but that's okay. We're going to take the one that's over designed to be cautious. So, what that says is we want a W10 by 45. Now, 
that's an astoundingly fast design process. Keep in mind we have not accounted for the self-weight of joists and girders, which we would obviously have to do. And we haven't accounted for the self-weight of the column, although you'll discover that the self-weight of the column in steel is essentially negligible. It's a very tiny fraction of the overall axial force that the column can withstand. Um, but we're in the ballpark, and in fact, I suspect when we throw in all those other factors, this 290, which was substantially more than the 252 that we're targeting at this point, probably will account really easily for whatever weight is associated with the joists and girders. But I threw this table in here at this point so that you would not get to this number and think, okay, that's a meaningless number. I have no idea what, what its purpose is. And so you forget it. The point is that you can go into a table really quickly and pick a column, and then you know how much that column weighs. You can find figures for the effective installed cost of steel or typical installed cost. And nowadays, um, basically, a uh, pound of steel installed costs about a dollar. Those numbers, of course, change uh, according to the demand and the economic situation. Prices were skyrocketing for a while, and then the worldwide economic meltdown of 2007-2008 uh, had some impact on the cost of uh, construction materials. But generally speaking, you're in the ballpark to say that this column will cost $45 a linear foot installed. Okay, so if we wanted to ask ourselves what's the axial force in other columns besides the interior one, we said that the interior column supports twice the floor area of a column in the perimeter wall. Um, so if we wanted to know the total factored force, axial force, in a column in the exterior wall, we divide whatever we got for the interior column by two. So we got 252 kips. When we divide by two, we get 126. When we go to a corner column, we cut the area of floor in half again, or it's one quarter of the axial uh, force in an interior column. So we basically say the total factored force for a corner column is the total factored force for an inter interior column divided by 4, or in other words, 252 kips over 4, which is 63 kips. So those columns would be designed for this force and that force. The one comment I would make at this point is that even though corner columns have much lower axial forces in them from the gravity loads than do interior columns, we often include bracing elements in the perimeter wall, which under wind load induce fairly substantial forces in the corner columns. The corner columns tend to take the brunt of the effects of wind bracing in the perimeter walls of the building. So we've only looked at half the problem, which is the uh, gravity load issue. At some point, we also have to look at whatever axial forces are induced in these columns due to the effect of various bracing elements that help resist wind loads. That concludes our discussion of the formula P equals PA, where we're running example calculations.